Welcome everyone uh, to welcome to what's new uh, for OpenShift 4.12. Uh, thanks for uh, joining from wherever you are in the world uh, and whatever time zone you might be in. Uh, you know, you are here with me, Tushar Katarki, and uh, my peers uh, and teammates uh, on the OpenShift product management team. And we are very pleased to bring you what's new in OpenShift 4.12. Without further ado, let me go to the next slide. Uh, you know, with OpenShift 4.12, uh, we have packed it with uh, features and capabilities that our customers and partners have asked for. Uh, we strengthen our core uh, here and our security, uh, as well as we have some exciting things to talk about at the edge, uh, while also uh, ensuring that there is operational and scale capabilities across all these pillars. And uh, we will be talking about each one of these in detail in this spotlight section, uh, which is uh, coming up very soon, so stick around. Uh, with that said, uh, Kubernetes 1.25 is what uh, OpenShift 4.12 is based on, and you will see here uh, a number of, uh, you know, the Kubernetes and the upstream community obviously continues to add a number of capabilities for our customers. Uh, you know, kudos to all the contributors from Red Hat and elsewhere to make this successful. Uh, things to call out really are, I mean, you will see so many kind of security related um, topics uh, continuing to see attention. Uh, and there is username spaces, there is uh, checkpoints for forensic analysis, uh, there is the port security uh, admission, uh, which is the new one and the old one, the port security policies which has served okay so far, is uh, actually being removed in this, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, a lot of exciting things. There are blog posts around this, and you will see some of this mentioned in our OpenShift 4.12 too, so very exciting to um, With that, I'll hand it over to Heather to talk some of the top RFEs and components. Yeah, thank you. We shipped 49 requests for enhancements in 4.12, these are direct customer asks that come to us from um, customers. Uh, a lot of them are network configuration related uh, as everyone's network looks different. Next. All right. Uh, also with OpenShift 4.12, we're introducing some lifecycle changes. Uh, specifically for even numbered releases, starting with OpenShift 4.12, we are adding a six month extended update support phase, uh, taking the total life cycle for the uh, even numbered releases to 24 months. Um, this would apply to uh, those who have premium subscriptions to OpenShift, uh, whether it's OpenShift uh, Container Platform, uh, OKE, or the OpenShift Platform Plus offering, um, or those with standard subscriptions who buy an add on SKU uh, that will be available in the near future. Um, the reason for doing this, uh, we, we have customers and partners, uh, particularly uh, looking at some of our uh, use cases as we move towards the edge, who are struggling with the cadence of, of Kubernetes and OpenShift updates, uh, particularly for devices or servers that they wish to put into the field for long periods of time uh, in between upgrades. Uh, so the approach here with the EUS releases, on, or that EUS phase on the even numbered releases, is to allow them longer time, time to soak those in the field. Um, we are also with the way the, the SKUs uh, work with the, the premium um, offering attachment and also with the standard subscriptions plus the add-on, we are aligning this with the way the extended update phase uh, works with uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux as well. Um, important to note, uh, the EOS to EOS upgrades facility that we added in uh, 4.8 to 4.10 uh, does continue with the same behavior. Uh, so that means that as, as we upgrade from 4.12 to a future um, EOS release, uh, you will still have to go through that uh, interim release in between to complete the upgrade. Uh, and also that layered operators and operands will continue to have their own life cycles as well, uh, which will be advertised on the OpenShift lifecycle page as they are today. Uh, if we move forward, we'll get into our OpenShift 4.12 uh, spotlight features. Uh, so first up, uh, we're going to talk about a new offering we're introducing that was announced at KubeCon called Red Hat Device Edge. Uh, Red Hat Device Edge is aiming to add uh, Kubernetes to a small form factor field deployed uh, edge device, uh, so something like a, a, a board computer or a system on a chip type device, um, you know, something like uh, two cores, two gig of RAM as a bare minimum, 
uh, where we combine Red Hat Enterprise Linux for Edge, uh, the footprint uh, that we have already got in the field for Edge deployments on the, the RHEL side, uh, with MicroShift, a, a just enough Kubernetes uh, distribution uh, based on the same Kubernetes builds as OpenShift, um, optimized around having a lower footprint. Uh, and again, this is to address market demand as we get further and further out to the edge uh, and these smaller devices and some of the constraints that come with them uh, to deploy Kubernetes and consistent APIs to them. Next slide, please. So if we look at the Red Hat Device Edge technical overview uh, slide, at the, at the lower level, we have all of the things provided by Red Hat Enterprise Linux in that for Edge deployment footprint. Um, and on top of that, we are adding uh, Kubernetes or MicroShift binary uh, including the basic Kubernetes cluster services and Kubernetes orchestration, of course. Um, all in a way that is consistent with OpenShift, while again, uh, optimizing for that bare minimum that people need to deploy an application uh, in a constrained computing environment at the edge. Uh, the target again, two cores, two gig of RAM. Um, this will be introduced as a dev preview uh, in 4.12 um, with a view to moving to support later in the year. Um, next up, uh, I believe Marcos is going to talk about some other exciting things we're doing for edge computing more in the cloud space. Jude, do you want to cover this? Since yeah, I sorry. I'm just pulling up my audio. Um, yes, so in 4.12, we're making it easier for you to deliver low latency applications closer to your end users and on-premises um, installations. And so what we're doing is we're extending OpenShift to the edge by adding support for AWS Outposts and AWS Local Zones for customer-managed OpenShift on AWS. So with um, Outposts, Customers using self-managed OpenShift on AWS can now provision OpenShift clusters to take advantage of outposts. This feature is in Tech Preview, and um, what this means is you're now able to run your applications closer to the edge and taking advantage of the APIs that you're used to in the AWS regions, all while using local compute and storage resources um, on outposts. And so what this means is now your OpenShift control planes run in the AWS regions, um, but your re remote worker nodes run on AWS outposts. And one of the key things to note about it is you can do the deployments using our full stack automation uh, with the installer provision infrastructure. And you'll need to note that you'll need to use uh, GP2 for storage on outposts. For local zones, um, we're also extending workers to the edge um, with local zones. And what this means is you can take advantage of an existing um, VPC, uh, which has uh, subnets in your AWS local zones. And a um, couple things to note here also is you'll also use the IPI installation method. And you'll also uh, need to use the AWS application load balancer or ALB in order to deploy to local zones for your custom ingress. Um, next. So, we are very excited to announce in OpenShift 4.12 uh, the agent-based installer, uh, which we say for these connected OpenShift deployments, and this one of the um, specialities of this new installer, but, you know, it's for any kind of installation of OpenShift. So, if you think about the installers that we have today, um, they exist for a reason. Uh, here you have a screenshot of what you find when you try to install OpenShift, in this case, an example, um, bare metal. Uh, we have interactive workflows, uh, web-based. Uh, we have automated workflows, very opinionated. And we have uh, full control uh, workflows, that's the UPI. That, for some, can be a bit complex. So with the agent-based installer, what we are trying to, to do and, and to solve is to provide an easy way to deploy OpenShift on-premise with all the flexibility that you have with uh, the assisted installer, for example, which is a pretty successful uh, installer, based, uh, web-based, um, all in one installer that's part and integrated in the OpenShift install binary that many of you already know. So with the agent-based installer, you're going to be able to install OpenShift from a bootable image uh, that doesn't require anything else. You have the image, 
you will boot that image on the target hosts and you will have, uh, by the end of the installation, your OpenShift cluster. Uh, in this release, we support, uh, obviously, these connected uh, environments. Uh, this is key. This is uh, one of the focuses that we have. But uh, we will support bare metal, vSphere, and also platform agnostic, or also known as uh, platform non. We support all the topologies that we support with it. Uh, that is the single node OpenShift, uh, compact clusters, uh, that is three nodes uh, clusters with scalable uh, masters. And it's CLI based in this first iteration, so that means that it allows to be automated by third party orchestration uh, tools, if, if so you want. Um, and it's based on technologies that you're already using, uh, like the uh, assisted service, which is the engine behind the assisted installer. So we hope you can uh, try it in OpenShift 4.12. And with this, I'll pass it on to Adele. Thank you, Ramon. Um, so for hosted control planes, uh, we're going to continue to tech preview uh, hosted control planes on AWS. Additionally, we're going to preview um, or introduce a preview for bare metal using the system installer flow. We also call that the agent flow. Um, and then we're continuing to dev preview um, Azure and Kubevert, especially for use cases like OpenShift and OpenShift. The way you can get hosted control planes is by um, going to the operator hub and installing the multi-cluster engine for Kubernetes operator. Once you do that, uh, you'll need to enable the add-on uh, for the preview because HyperShift is, or hosted control planes is still in preview. Once you enable the add-on, the HyperShift operator is going to be installed in your cluster, and you're ready to create hosted, hosted clusters using hosted control planes. Um, optionally, you can also use the Advanced Cluster Manager. Advanced Cluster Manager uses by default or relies on the multi-cluster engine uh, for Kubernetes operators, so it's installed by default when you get to the ACM um, uh, level. And in addition to that, you're going to have all the capabilities of ACM, like policy management across cluster, uh, fleet observability, and more. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so if you look at the big picture, as Ramon mentioned, we have introduced multiple installation flows, and especially what we're doing was trying to be use case driven. So depending on your use case, depending on your environment, and depending on how flexible you want your deployment to be, you're going to have the option to choose any of the four options that we have, uh, provide at day zero. You can have the interactive option that uses the system installer with the standard configuration. You can have your automated flow that, that you're used to using IPI. Um, the local agent base that Ramon talked about, that is really uh, useful and makes a lot of sense for air gap and disconnected environments. And finally, if you want full control over your install flow, you can do that with normal UPI installs. <clears throat> Once you've done that, and you can turn in the, this cluster, that zero, the day zero cluster, into a hub cluster to manage a fleet of clusters. Um, you can do that in one of the two ways. Uh, either you already have advanced cluster manager, um, which allows you to do an enforced policy of scales, do uh, fleet uh, observability, and more. Or you can go ahead and install the multi-cluster engine for Kubernetes operator, which, as mentioned, um, brings along the hosted control planes uh, feature uh, and hypershift operators. And doing so, you're turning your cluster into a hub cluster to manage multiple uh, a fleet from. And this cluster is also going to act as a hypershift management cluster. Now, uh, once you have a hub cluster, you can start deploying OpenShift clusters as spoke clusters. These spoke clusters can either be standalone using a system installer, using UPI, using IPI, or they can be hosted control planes which is basically using hosted control plane uh, hypershift as a backend for deploying the clusters. Um, so yeah, you're going to be able to manage the fleet using either standalone or hypershift just by turning on uh, an operator on a hub cluster. Um, I'm going to turn on to Ali to talk more about the control and dynamic plugins. Hey, folks. Uh, so uh, we're very excited to announce that in 4.12, dynamic plugins becomes GA. Um, it's the number one console uh, enhancement request uh, is uh, the ability to customize the console in one fashion or another. So with uh, Dynamic Plugins, customers and partners now have the ability to customize OCP console in a supported manner. Uh, the SDK allows for the creation of new pages, navigation items, tabs, resources, and more. Uh, the sky is truly the limit with Dynamic Plugins. To get started, uh, please follow the links provided. 
Um, and now I'd like to pass it off to uh, Mark Curry. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, so there are many new networking specific features in OpenShift. We'll discuss a few spotlights here and come back to the others later in the presentation. Red Hat OpenShift networking is not any one thing. It's an ecosystem of all products and projects that formulate in their aggregate OpenShift networking and provide all of its features and functions. One uh, key component of all those things that make up that networking ecosystem is the Kubernetes CNI plugin. So starting with OpenShift 4.12, the default out-of-the-box Kubernetes CNI plugin for OpenShift is OVN Kubernetes. And this is true for all new installations across all platforms and topologies, with one exception, IBM Cloud, where it still uh, is currently an option, not the default. Uh, supported since 4.6 and with thousands of production deployments already out there in the field, the OVN Kubernetes plugin has already become the default for some of our Topologies and platforms um, as listed here on the slide. Uh, OVN Kubernetes has full feature parity with the previous default CNI plugin, OpenShift SDN, um, but it adds a, a wider array of features like IPv6, IPsec, hybrid Windows, Linux networking, and hardware offload capabilities. Um, so while the use of Oven Kubernetes is not required, customers that want to switch to Oven Kubernetes but don't want to greenfield a brand new cluster to do it, can use a fully supported procedure in our product documentation to migrate their deployment from the previous plugin to the newer uh, Oven Kubernetes plugin. Uh, so what about clusters that are still using the pre-412 default CNI plugin? First, it's important to understand that the previous default plugin is not going away anytime soon. Uh, existing deployments using the older plugin <clears throat> will continue to be fully supported but no new features will be added to that plugin. The new default uh, plugin uh, only applies to version 4.12 and newer clusters. So earlier versions of OpenShift will continue to default to the previous CNI plugin. And at OpenShift 4.12, the previously uh, default plugin is now relegated to an install time option rather than the default. Next, please. Uh, in addition to a modernized CNI plugin, our customers asked us to provide more network observability in the product for a variety of use cases. Happy to say that with the release of 4.12, OpenShift network observability is a fully supported optional add-on operator for all currently supported versions of OpenShift starting with 4.10 and onward. Network observability is integrated with the OpenShift console and installs additional tooling in its uh, networking subtab. The operator uses XDP eBPF-based agents on the cluster nodes to collect networking metrics, and it provides multiple re representations of that data, for example, the dashboard, tabular, and topology views that are shown here. Um, and these are especially important to network-minded developers and administrators to reduce the complexity and to help them understand, debug, and optimize their network traffic. Focusing on observable traffic metrics uh, like flow topology and tracing can really simplify identification of network bottlenecks, assist with troubleshooting connectivity issues, and also help to optimize network performance in OpenShift clusters. Next slide, please. We are happy to announce the Red Hat um, Advanced Cluster Security Cloud Service is on field trial, and we are looking forward to hear for customer feedback. With ACS as a service, you install a minimal software on your Kubernetes cluster and can start securing it in minutes. We support OpenShift on private and public clouds, but also we support other Kubernetes flavors provided by the major hyperscalers. Forget about all the operational overhead and let Red Hat Red Hat worry about that instead. You will save time on provisioning, rescaling, doing security patches, software updates, upgrades, and backup and recovery. The service is financially backed by Red Hat, and you will receive 24 by 7 support offered by us. Finally, enjoying flexible consumption models that includes pay as you go, and also you can use your committed spend to purchase ACS on Red Hat, AWS, and Azure Marketplace. And with this, we close the spotlight section and we move over with Ali to the console. 
everyone, Ollie here again. So uh, as mentioned previously with dynamic plugins, we've had a, no a number of enhancement requests around customizing the console. So another area of improvement is that we are providing a form-based method to co uh, customize the console even further. Uh, this new feature gives cluster admins the ability to configure the visibility of the admin and dev perspectives, quick starts, developer catalog, and the ability to set the default cluster roles for the dev perspective. So to do this, admins can go to the cluster settings in the administration navigation area, click on the console uh, configuration, then uh, select the configuration tab, and then uh, select customize from the actions menu. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with every release, we like to highlight our customer happiness features, which are direct requests from our current customers. It is, uh, it's very important to us that our customers are heard. Um, I won't go through each of these RFPs here, but uh, I'll leave this list for a reference. And these are all the RFPs that made it into 4.12 for uh, OCP console alone. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, for the developer experience, we have so much content that we uh, created a separate session for it. Highlights are around enhancements to the dev console, Podman desktop, dev spaces, and uh, ODO becoming GA. So for the deep dive into the developer uh, features being delivered in and alongside OpenShift 4.12, uh, please check out the link, uh, linked video and slides at the bottom of this slide. And um, now I'd like to pass it off to uh, James Faulkner. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Ali. So um, OpenShift 4.12 supports a wide variety of runtimes and frameworks for developers to use. So I want to highlight some of the featured ones that we have in the product today and some of the recent updates. So the first one I'll mention is Quarkus. So if you haven't heard of Quarkus, it's a um, cube native Java framework. Starts up super fast, uh, takes very little memory, and it's really complementary to the way that Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, deploy and, and manage applications. So in OpenShift 4.12, we now have full support for Java 17 for both traditional JVM apps as well as native executables using Graal VM. We've also added a new uh, developer UI for uh, browsing and, uh, and and monitoring your Kafka deployment. So if you're using Kafka, whether you're using it um, you know, on-prem, self-managed, or through the uh, Red Hat OpenShift uh, Apache Kafka uh, capabilities, we have a new dev UI that you can you know, look at topics, look at messages coming through. It's very, it makes it very easy to develop with Kafka. Uh, we also have dev services. So these are things that automatically get created for you. So if you're building a, a, an application that uses Elasticsearch, we will fire up Elasticsearch for you in developer mode. You, know, you no longer have to set anything up and it kind of wires it all into your application for you. We also have a new um, uh, capabilities within the InfiniSpan uh, dev services. So again, it will fire up an in-memory data grid for you. Um, and has some API improvements there. We've also added in, in the latest version of OpenShift uh, support for uh, direct OpenID Connect uh, providers, things like Apple, Facebook, GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're building an application, you want to protect your APIs uh, with these third-party providers. It's super simple to do this now. And then lastly, uh, new support for um, uh, service binding. We've had support in there. We've added support for uh, uh, workload projection for reactive SQL clients. So if you're building a reactive uh, you know, event-driven, non-blocking um, application with Quarkus, and you're using MariaDB or MySQL um, or any of the reactive versions of those, it will automatically bind those services, uh, your applications to those services uh, through Kubernetes service binding. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, uh, two more uh, runtimes I wanted to highlight here. We have um, support for Apache Tomcat. This is Red Hat's um, uh, productized version of Apache Tomcat. Uh, the newest version uh, in OpenShift 4.12 includes updates to uh, the base Tomcat itself, as well as Apache HTTP server, full support for RHEL 9, and then minor updates to some of the capabilities that have always been in that product. So if you're building uh, applications, web applications or serverless applications with, uh, with Tomcat, uh, check out JBoss Web Server. It's built into OpenShift, and you have full support for that. Um, it also has an operator as well if you want to deploy your applications and manage them uh, through a Kubernetes operator. Uh, next slide. Uh, the last runtime I wanted to focus on now is, is uh, Eclipse Adoptium. So this comes out of the uh, of Eclipse uh, Adoptium project. They have a new distribution of OpenJDK. So if you're building Java apps on, on OpenShift, you have a lot of flexibility here. It's one of the most popular, if not the most popular um, runtime for a Java runtime, based Java runtime with 400 million downloads and 200,000 downloads a day. Um, fully supported on OpenShift for both uh, all three of the, the, the LTS releases of Java, so 8, 11, and 17. Uh, we also have uh, support for things like Mac OS if you're, if you're doing uh, de development on Mac OS. Um, and we have published official container images for that uh, for use on OpenShift as well. And then lastly, 
a GitHub Action support. So if you're building GitHub Actions and you're building Java applications, you'll have a new keyword in there called Temarin, which is the name of the Java distribution from Eclipse Adoptium. So it makes it super simple to build, you know, CI pipelines um, with GitHub Actions and using this most popular and fully supported uh, runtime on OpenShift. That's it for uh, uh, Runtime's developer updates. I'll pass it over to Kustav for platform services. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so as you know, right, OpenShift Pipelines is uh, based on a Tekton, which is a powerful uh, yet flexible Kubernetes native open source framework for creating continuous integration and delivery systems. Uh, so from the last time we made, we have a small update on Tekton, uh, which is that Tekton has graduated as a CD Foundation project in the last quarter. Uh, coming to OpenShift 4.12, uh, we are releasing Pipelines 1.9 version. And in Pipelines 1.9 version, uh, we have added support for Tekton resolvers uh, that runs uh, in a Kubernetes cluster alongside Tekton Pipelines. And it resolves requests for tasks and pipelines from remote locations. Uh, as resolvers, we support built-in gate, uh, cluster, bundle, and hub, etc. Uh, the Tekton resolvers, uh, it will be in tech review, and it, I, we, it will be very useful for our customers, uh, many of whom are running uh, remote pipelines. Uh, we are also making pipeline as code, uh, which is an opinionated CI solution on top of OpenShift pipelines uh, as generally available. Uh, pipeline as, print, as code has been in tech preview for quite some time. Uh, we have continuously gathered feedback from our customers uh, who are actively trying out back in their environment and made various feature enhancements. Uh, some of the enhancements that we are releasing in pack alongside uh, making it as generally available are uh, you know, we are adding support for uh, concurrency mode in the repository CRD. Uh, also, we are adding support for advanced event matching uh, based on file path or uh, Pull request or merge request titles on your Git provider. Also, uh, as requested, requested by uh, various other customers who are trying out PAC, uh, now PAC comes with better error telling uh, both in CLI as well as uh, in different kind of Git providers such as GitHub. Uh, so uh, we display various pipeline run errors and add a small snippet into the GitHub checks or as a VCS comment. Uh, in 1.9, uh, we are also adding support for CSI and projected volumes uh, to be used as workspaces uh, in OpenShift pipelines. Uh, another key feature that we are releasing as tech preview uh, is that uh, for, we understand that there are customer pain points uh, with managing Keycane and Keycane Pack CLI. Uh, with Pack now becoming uh, GA, we want to provide a uniform delivery and usage method for both the CLIs. So we are consolidating TKN and TKN back, and we are delivering OpenShift Pipeline CLI or OPC. Uh, it will be again in tech preview mode. A uh, couple of other key deliverables in 1.9 include uh, OpenShift Pipelines uh, now becoming available in Dev Sandbox and some minor UX improvements uh, for pipelines inside Dev console. Uh, with that, I now hand it over to Harriet to talk about OpenShift Thanks, Gustav. The OpenShift GitOps version 1.7 will be available with OpenShift 4.12, and this will include our upstream Argo CD version 2.6. So similar to uh, Tekton, the Argo project recently graduated from the CNCF. Very exciting. Uh, some highlights from our latest release. Uh, we've added support for server-side apply. This lets you update or sync a partial object that you're opinionated about. And it can be useful for patching resources and also if your resource doesn't fit in an annotation. The team has also added a tech preview to support managing applications across namespaces. So Argo CD can now recognize application resources that have been applied across the cluster, and not just within the namespace where Argo CD has been deployed. You give a list of namespaces to manage and it will be able to keep them all in sync. Uh, there have been a bunch more improvements to the operator. Uh, you can now set custom node selectors in the Argo CD custom resource. Any additional selectors that are added will be merged with any existing ones, such as run on infra. We've also added the ability for admins to disable the link to Argo CD from the OpenShift console. More information about the features I've mentioned, as well as a full list of updates and fixes, can be found in the release notes of OpenShift GitOps version 1.7. I'll hand over to Nina to talk about serverless. Thank you, Harriet. Um, OpenShift Serverless makes your OpenShift and OpenShift++ by offering better auto-scaling and networking for your stateless microservices containers and functions containers. 
Um, it is based on the upstream project Knative, and with 4.12, we would be updating it to Knative 1.6. We are very excited to announce that serverless functions is now GA with Quarkus runtime. Serverless function dramatically increases developer velocity by providing templates for jumpstarting your app. It offers local developer experience through CLI and IDE, as you can see um, in the GIF, and it also offers in-cluster build for your production needs. Uh, Kafka Broker and Kafka Sync are also GA for all your production needs around creating event-driven applications. Kafka Broker maximizes Kafka performance and reduces network hops. Another GA um, shout out is for init containers and persistent volume claims for implementing any initialization logic and using any permanent data storage that you need for your creating applications. Under our security promise, we have introduced MTLS natively in Knative as a tag preview feature. And the last, we have upgraded our serverless logic developer preview, which offers workflow capabilities for managing failures, retries, parallelizations, and service integrations. Uh, please see our release notes for the full list of features, and we would love to hear any feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Service Mesh helps you create secure, reliable microservices with enforced TLS encryption, zero trust traffic policies, and instant visibility with out-of-the-box metrics and traces. We recently introduced OpenShift Service, OpenShift Service Mesh 2.3, which updates Istio to 1.14. This release brings GA support for gateway injection, which allows Istio gateways to be deployed, managed, and upgraded independently of the Istio control plane. Some notable tech preview features in this release are a Service Mesh console plugin that brings the Kiali graph into the OpenShift console and weaves Service Mesh data into the workload and service pages. We have also introduced a cluster-wide installation option that is optimized for large meshes within a single cluster. And to align with Upstream Istio, this will become the default installation option in our future releases. We are continuing to evolve Istio support for Kubernetes Gateway API uh, with Kiali support, as we have added in this release. And finally, this release brings support for federating service meshes across clusters on Azure Red Hat OpenShift RO. I will now hand off to Julian. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. Um, next slide. Yes, so let's talk about installer flexibility. So, um, as you've noted, uh, we currently have um, a bunch of different installation methods and supported providers in 4.12. There are four specifically. The first one is around full stack automation and what historically folks remember as installer provision infrastructure, where the installer controls all areas of the installation, including the infrastructure provisioning, and it provides opinionated best practices on how you deploy OpenShift. Uh, the second method is the pre-existing infrastructure deployment method, which uses, uh, which we call user provision infrastructure, where you're responsible for provisioning and managing your own infrastructure to allow you a greater uh, customization and operational flexibility and control. Uh, the third one is interactive connected experience, and this is around uh, what we call the assisted installer, and this provides you a web-based uh, experience for creating your clusters. And then lastly, in the spotlight section, we've highlighted the agent-based installer, which provides a streamlined experience for deploying OpenShift in a fully disconnected or air-gapped environment. So with all of this, and we've also highlighted earlier in the spotlight section, um, we've added support for AWS local zones and AWS outposts. Uh, we are continuing to enhance our integrations with OpenShift and other cloud providers. And to that end, we're also delighted to extend this now to include OpenShift on IBM Cloud VPC, which is now promoted to GA. Uh, we're enabling you to acquire OpenShift directly from the GCP marketplace. Um, we also have shared VPC support with um, GCP with the IPI installer. We've added support for ARM on Azure, as well as expanding to enable zone awareness on OpenShift vSphere. We're continuing to make progress on cluster API, which will 
um, become our standard way for provisioning, upgrading, and operating multiple Kubernetes clusters. And we still have work to do on this front. And um, in the meantime, the machine API will continue to be used. But let's dig in and take a look at some of the exciting new features. Next slide. Um, so OpenShift in vSphere is zone aware. So beginning in OpenShift 4.12, uh, we're introducing the ability to install OpenShift zonal clusters in vSphere using the installer provision infrastructure method. And this is a tech preview feature. And this leverages uh, vCenter tags to associate those tags with OpenShift regions and OpenShift zones. And so now customers can associate vCenter data centers with OpenShift regions, and then similarly vCenter clusters with OpenShift zones. And uh, you can actually see that in this diagram. And what this allows you to do is to start to have better awareness of having separate uh, failure domains and create a uh, better higher availability for your deployments. Next slide. Um, some of the notable changes that we have in OpenShift 12 is that we're going to remove support for VMware vSphere 6.7 U2 as well as um, 7.0 U1 is being deprecated. And then similarly on the virtual hardware version 13, this has been removed. A um, couple reasons for why we're mentioning this is as you start thinking about upgrading to a newer release, like say 4.13, um, there are some things you're going to have to be aware of, and namely you need to be upgrading to um, 7.0 update 2 or later. And this, the reason for this is if you don't um, make those upgrades, um, your cluster will be marked unupgradable. And so this is part of the changes that we're planning around CSI migration. And my colleague Gregory Chereau will be talking about this in more detail as he shares the uh, storage updates. Next slide. Um, let's talk about flexible OpenShift installation. And so for some time now, there's been an increased desire to move away from a one-size-fits-all cluster installation and be more flexible on how um, a cluster gets built out of the box. And this is to reduce security exposure. Um, it's also to reduce, reduce uh, resource consumption and so on. And so you can see this in efforts such as the HyperShift or hosted control planes that Adele talked about earlier, or a single node OpenShift or compact clusters or Red Hat OpenShift local, or even uh, Red, Hat, Red Hat device edge with the smaller form factor. So in conjunction with all of these efforts to make the installation more flexible, uh, we're continuing our efforts to make OpenShift more composable but by providing a mechanism for you to exclude one or more optional components during the installation. And this in turn will basically determine what payload components are installed and what doesn't get installed in the cluster. So in the previous release, uh, we already made it possible to disable the marketplace operator, the samples operator, and the um, bare metal operator. And now in 4.12, we've expanded that list to now include console operator, the insights operator, the storage operator, and um, CSI snapshot controller operator. And so you can uh, disable these settings uh, by making some changes within the install config YAML that's noted in this particular slide. And then after you've disabled this, um, you also have the ability to re-enable them after a cluster is installed, should you choose. Next slide. So, um, in 4.12, uh, we're now promoting the deployment of OpenShift on IBM Cloud to GA. And what this means is you can now deploy private clusters in IBM Virtual Private Clouds using the installer provision infrastructure or full stack automation method. Um, and what this means is that you, you can now create private or disconnected deployments as well. Um, using OpenShift in an existing VPC. A couple things to note is IBM Cloud still only supports um, IPv4, so dual stack or IPv6 environments are not yet possible. Next slide. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing on or what we're doing in 4.12 for GCP. 
And so furthering our commitment uh, towards the open hybrid cloud, you can now use your committed GCP spend towards purchasing and running um, Red Hat offerings directly through the GCP marketplace. And um, in addition to that, um, we're delighted uh, to announce that in 412, customers such as yourselves will now be able to deploy GCP using your existing shared VPC or XPN um, configurations using the IPI workflow. Uh, please note that this is in tech preview. We've had a lot of interest in this. And a um, couple things to note is with this particular method, um, you still need to pre-create some of your resources such as network, subnets, firewall rules, and uh, DNS configurations. And lastly, um, you're also now able to take advantage of using um, a GCP instance that has a service account bound to it instead of downloading your service account keys for uh, OpenShift deployments on GCP. So let me hand this off to Heather to talk about transparent network proxy installs. Prior to OpenShift 4.12, customers who wanted to install clusters with transparent network level proxies needed to wrangle with OpenShift install create manifest unless their cluster could get far enough to make it to day two changes via the cluster's uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes API. Uh, folks periodically trip over this and end up complaining to the installer about surprising additional trust bundle handling. Uh, providing Now we're providing more convenient configuration with more discoverable documentation, which will reduce the customer pain tripping over the existing UX wrinkle and will also reduce installer noise responding to customer complaint. Next. Thanks, Heather. Um, I get to talk to you all about cluster infrastructure now. Huzzah. Um, so we continue to do loads of work on the provider side of things, but I guess the big ticket item for this release is what we're nicely calling managed control planes. And why do you come why do you care about that? Well, you know, if you wanted to scale your control plane, maybe you wanted a larger configuration machines, there's a process there now that lets you do it, but maybe it's a little bit manual, maybe it's not as easy as you would like it to be. So here we come with managed control planes. We've automatically automated the task for you, um, and you can scale your systems up or indeed down much more easily. Um, this is useful not only for moving to bigger systems, but you can use it to do a replacement of a specific control plane machine, you know, if it's acting up or something like that. This is particularly useful in today's world of managed services. So if you're, you know, if you imagine that you're running a cloud with loads of customers on that could be internal or external, then you want those tasks to be really easy. So this is kind of one thing that we see being much, uh, much needed in the industry, as it were. Um, next slide, please. Um, next up is um, systems enablement, um, which we've renamed the multi-architecture compute group for um, to. Um, and you know, the, a few things are happening here. Um, the first one is uh, multi-architecture compute, um, which you may have heard us refer to as heterogeneous compute in the past. That's going to stay in tech preview for now, only on Azure. Um, but don't worry, we're beavering away on that, and you'll see more on it, I guess, in, in, in future releases. If you do want to play with it, um, there is a multi-arc payload there, um, and you can kind of force pay, payload, uh, force upgrades, excuse me, um, but it's not something that's supported, but you can go and try it out. On the ARM side, um, G's already mentioned this, but repeat your message to get it set, um, set home. We now offer OCP um, on ARM, on Azure, with our um, automated installation or IPI installation method. Again, watch out for UPI coming soon. Um, on the Power and Z side, um, just one thing I'm going to mention here. Do take a look at the release notes. Uh, there are some deprecations in there for the older systems. There's too many to kind of list on the slide here. Um, so just take a look at that. They're not going away now, but they will in the future. So this is a chance you know, to work with your customers, give them an advanced heads up that things are happening there. Um, and next, I would love to hear Mark Russell tell us some um, interesting facts about what's next for CoreOS. Hey everybody, thanks Duncan. Uh, hey folks, what if you could take virtually the whole world of container native tooling and apply it to how you manage your operating updates and configuration? That's what we aim to find out, making OS container images that are bootable. 
So these aren't like your regular application container images that you would use with a container engine like Podman or Cryo. These are operating OS containers that contain kernel packages and everything needed to update on-disk content for physical and virtual machines. But because they're in OCI format, every tool and technique that you know from app containers can now be applied to these bootable host images. Build, inspect, test, and mirror them the same way you do with any other container. In 4.12, we're officially supporting this usage for support-delivered RHEL hotfix packages. However, it can be used uh, as a dev developer preview for any customization. You could copy in configuration files without using machine configs, install third-party agents or extra packages. Uh, the sky's the limit. Next slide. So here's a simplified hotfix example. Maybe it'll just clarify things a little bit. I'll be quick. Here we have a Docker file, uh, also known as a container file, that essentially says, take the latest RHEL CoreOS image, copy in a couple of hotfix RPM packages inside this container image, and install them, overriding the versions that are built into the base image. After you build, then you build it with Podman or another tool, push it to a registry, and from there you can now apply that customized image one or more of your pools in the cluster. Thanks, so next up is Gil with the latest happenings with uh, Shift on Stack. Take it away, Gil. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. So uh, starting, actually started in uh, 10, graduating to GA in 4.12, we are introducing the deployment of OpenShift on top of OpenStack DCM, which basically means that we can leverage the remote worker of OpenStack uh, which is mostly targeting the nearest aggregation layer, so from the uh, uh, centralized site up to the big aggregation layers, which is mostly the tier one aggregation layers. We can actually deploy uh, OpenShift clusters as a whole, masters and walkers, and we can also span uh, walkers across different OpenStack AZs, granted the limitation that we have for the receiving uh, uh, networking, so basically we need to keep it under 100 millisecond round trip. And this is something which is also involving op uh, OpenStack 16.2, so we will need to adhere to that also. Uh, next slide, please. Building on top of that, in 4.12, we're introducing in Dev Preview the ability to actually fully stretch the OpenShift cluster. So based on the same uh, topology that we discussed in the slide before, we can actually have fully stretched control planes on different AZs, meaning we can have the same clusters as we had before, deploy them uh, as a monolithic cluster per AZ, or we can even spend them across multiple AZs. This is something which is more targeting uh, campus-oriented deployment, so it's more of an AJ uh, deployment scenario rather than actually uh, spanning those clusters across different aggregation layers. But this is something that we've been asked by multiple customers to provide, and this is something that gives us fully AJ awareness within the OpenStack platform to cater for OpenShift high availability. Um, we are targeting to have it in tech preview in 4.13 and fully GA in 4.14. Also, we need to have OpenStack uh, 16.2 as the baseline uh, and build on top of that. Next slide, please. A bit of a detour, but we are introducing a new deployment method uh, for OpenStack. Kind of, we can think a bit of something in, in the lines of people already imagined. We're actually using OpenShift as the infrastructure to drive the OpenStack deployment and host the control plane. We are leveraging uh, CNV, so OpenShift virtualization, to host the control plane VMs for OpenStack. We are using Metal 3 as the bare metal inventory, so think of it as some of you have some OpenStack knowledge as a pre-provisioned deployment of OpenStack, but now we are using OpenShift as the go-to infrastructure, uh, which actually gives our customers the ability to grab the rope in both ends. So they can have on the same common infrastructure, 
the next gen uh, fully containerized workloads running on bare metal, and they can also have their traditional uh, VNFs or traditional virtualization uh, workloads running basically on dedicated nodes, which are the OpenStack nodes. By the way, those nodes are transient, so I can basically scale up or scale down the bare, the bare metal inventory and shift those nodes around if I need to run, for example, more OpenShift workload or more OpenStack load, workload to support it. And yes, we are supporting sandwiches. So if anyone wants to run OpenShift on top of OpenStack on top of OpenShift, we can accommodate that. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to Tushar for the control plane updates. Thank you, Gil, and everybody. Thank, uh, I'm uh, going to cover a couple of updates on the control plane. Uh, you know, Gaurav is not here, so I'm covering on behalf of him. Uh, the first one is really the tech preview for a new CLI manager, uh, which is Creo. Creo is the upstream name for it, so we are continuing that uh, with Creo. Uh, you know, uh, being added to OC, uh, you can discover OC plugins. You can uh, install those, and then uh, you can also keep updated. So this makes um, OC uh, with Crew uh, much more pluggable, and therefore you can kind of install your favorite uh, CL supported plugins use it that way. Uh, try it, uh, it's a tech preview. Uh, the other thing obviously really is uh, two exciting new things at the core uh, of the platform. One is C run. Uh, this is an OCI runtime, which is written in C, uh, and therefore it offers a faster and lower memory footprint than uh, run C. Uh, and uh, with uh, C groups V2, uh, you know, which is the next generation control plane uh, in the Linux kernel. We are introducing that also as well as tech preview. Uh, you know, this is C groups V2. Uh, with that, you get better node stability uh, for uh, out of memory uh, pressure scenarios. Uh, you get better page caching and back counting. Uh, and um, the current implementation is a one on one with V1 in, a, in terms of feature uh, compatibility, but it kind of that, that will slowly roll it in so that you can start consuming the new V2 specific features. So give both of them a try, uh, you know, uh, 4.12 and give us some feedback. With that, I'll hand it to uh, Maria to talk about security. We already mentioned uh, advanced cluster security class service in but there are also a number of other. We understand that one of the key areas of the platform is to make it simpler for users to prioritize issues. And for this, we have included a new top-level dashboard that is specifically designed for that. We have also made some adjustments in the network graph. Um, there are two um, ready-to-use policies that are very useful for admins, like for instance, checking privilege escalations and also um, checking whether uh, we have externally exposed services. ACS will use PostgreSQL as its backend database in the future. This will replace the current RocksDB that we use today. And we do this because this change will bring benefits such as um, improved performance, easier backup and restore, and also disaster recovery. Now we also provide a way to shift left your network policy creation. This is now in tech preview. And it is based on application YAML manifest. So you can use it to develop network policies as part of your CI-CD pipeline before deploying applications on your cluster. And the last part would be vulnerability management. We have included support for RHEL 9. But now we are also able to alert if you are using any component in your Docker file that contains CVEs. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about compliance operator. Um, compliance operator help, is an operator that helps you stay compliance against security standards, identify gaps, and provide remediations. Now we have also provided better control of the resources allocated for them. We do this by customizing CPU and memory resources per scan, but also watching the resources in the given namespace. We also now are able to prioritize which parts we want to scan first in the workloads. And we are even gonna get more accurate results by evaluating the default configuration values against the compliance rule. We have expanded also support of PCI DSS profiles. 
and now those will also be available in IBM Power Architect. We go to the next slide. I will be happy to present the security profile operator, which is going GA soon. Uh, it, security profile operator helps admins to use C Linux and SecCom effectively. We know one of the major issues that exist with both of these is how complex it is to actually create your profiles. This is the solution for that. It helps you to uh, create your profile and it does it by recording what your application needs and creates a profile for it. It also helps you manage the profiles across the nodes and namespaces and it's also able to validate if, for instance, a node doesn't support SECOM and in that case it doesn't apply it. It helps validate your profile. You can reuse your profiles across namespaces and you will be able to download this in operator app. And now over to the management, uh, Advanced Cluster Manager uh, with Scott. Hey, thank you, Maria. Fantastic, awesome experience to be here in 2023, launching with some great releases. In the management space, we continue to push further into the advanced. And as you'll see on this slide, governance kicks it off as one of our top features with a, with a set of a, a framework and policy engines that our customers continue to come back asking for more. That's awesome. One of the key features they want is to order their, the execution of their policies. Our policy engine now allows you to order those executions to ensure that you have a hierarchical uh, 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 enforcement. Uh, next, as you look at the automatic reconciliation, we're now seeking the secrets to the managed hubs via templating. The managed environments now can take an automatic approach for the reconciliation of resources from policy templating, whereas before that was a manual sync. And next, our policy generator now references the remote HTTPS style customized configs. This gives you super flexibility with pushing policy directly from the source. One of the key areas we looked at here is the community of practice and making sure that our GitOps patterns were always viable to the field and our customers directly from source. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about our Better Together strategy and how we're ensuring that anything that you, you create across the OpenShift Platform Plus portfolio works better together with ACM. In particular, you'll see enhancements across Ansible right here, making sure you have the best experience with policy violations by providing additional context into the Ansible post hook flows. We're also including Ansible workflows for both our cluster and application lifecycle events giving you broader range of flexibility in what you choose to automate on the Ansible side. We're even including labels and tags, which was a very highly requested customer feature to give you more information as you pump out those Ansible automations. We are a few days away from the ACM and MCE community operators. I'm told it should be the end of this week. That's been a long awaited feature set that gives our customers easier traction when adopting new features in the new release streams. You'll see those be ready for the sprint zero of our next release, which is 2.8. So as you want to put in early access and, and beta requests, start using those community operators and let us know how it works for you. Next, our better together pillar is really about focusing on application, secure, application deployment and HA models. The Metro DR is now GA, and that'll be with OCP 4.12 and ACM 2.7. We continue to work towards the GA of the regional DR, and that will remain as a tech preview right now. Lastly, again, in this Better Together theme, we're talking about multi-cluster networking with Submariner. Enhancements there include the automated configuration on ARO and ROSA, and highly requested features around disconnected and air-gapped environments. It's ready to go with OV and SDN, so as Mark Curry said, we're all set for you in 412. Let's kick it over to slide. 63, we'll talk about management at the edge for just a minute. This slide probably looks familiar, and it should, because we continue to hammer away on this highly sought after capability for, for full scope of management from the center out to the edge. ACM can now manage 3,500 single node open shifts. We appreciate the team and the ACM performance for what they're doing with testing the cycles out there. A DU is a distributed unit, so if you're familiar in the telco and RAN space, you'll understand we really think that is a single node open shift that's deploying edge capabilities out there where customers need to see it and use it to, to improve their experience. Of course, that's an IPv6 connected and disconnected scenarios. We understand that that continues to grow as a very highly sought after area of open shift capability. I also want to highlight our search squad. 
The version two called Odyssey is now GA and ready for high scale environments. I love the fact that we're bringing in the search resource details, bringing that more up to speed with the way it looks in the OpenShift console and expect further enhancements to those search uh, results in the coming releases. Uh, you'll also remember that we do have user configurable dynamics collection for your metrics. That's a great feature for management out at the edge. We'll slide forward to the next one here. Man, this is getting great. Topology aware lifecycle manager Talum. You may remember that used to be called Talo. This operator works alongside OCP 412 and ACM to ensure that you have the ability to group your assets, to group your clusters and roll out the policies in a phased approach. This is awesome. When you're looking at a national fleet, for example, if you're in the telco space and you have a provider network where you need to roll out units, uh, distributed units from one region to the next, you want to ensure that this, that the success rate of that rollout is moving at a pace that you expect it to. So it, it specifically in features here, I've got things like uh, specifically for single node OpenShift, the creation of backups and the restore scripts so that on a failure, you can actually restore that snow to the to the pre-cached image uh, before the upgrade kicked off. As you know, a single node is a single point of failure. So having a feature like that is awesome as you're rolling out across your provider network. Uh, next, uh, we'll slide into the last one here, which is around the backup solutions for OpenShift. This falls under our, our business continuity theme. And as we can see here, the OADP 1.1 version now has a native backup utility with 4.12. What's cool about this is you can continue to use the existing third-party backup applications with our ISVs, an awesome list that you can see there on the screen. But now we have a native utility for an OCP cluster backup that could be sent directly to the S3. So these native capabilities should make it easier for you to use any native snapshot data mover capability uh, using all the S3-based object storage outside of the cluster. This will work for any CSI snapshot supported storage, and you can use the CLI to schedule backups and restores from your from uh, from schedule. A UI is being worked on for later releases, so we'd love your feedback. Tell us how this is working for you and let us know what you need there. Again, this is GA now with OCP 4.12. Moving ahead, we're gonna kick it over to Roger to take it away with observability. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, so as a customer request, we are now trying to make the observability space more unified so instead of talking about the different pillars of metrics logs and traces we're now for 412 and forward we're going to talk about observability as a general to turn your data into answers and this is aims to provide this unified simplified and consistent experience that we want to have and we continue to work towards equal emphasis of these different what we call pillars uh, and that is like data collection, data storage, data delivery, data visualization, and data analytics. So let's take a look now what's new in this. And me and Jamie is going to take further. So next slide, please. So within the, the monitoring field, we are now allowing us users to specify topology spread constraints for the Prometheus alert and Thanos rule and also to improve the consistency of the Prometheus adapter. And what we need about topology spread constraints is that we ensure that the replicas are distributed in the, the, the way that you as an admin want to do. And that is also to improve like the overall performance of the system and to reduce the risk. And Jamie? So under the data collection pillar for observability, with the release of logging 5.6, this will be our GA of Vector uh, as an alternate collector to FluentD. Uh, some of the advantages of this are uh, Vector is very scalable. It's vendor neutral. Um, it consumes a lot less memory and has very flexible configuration options. So it makes the collection, the transformation, and the sending of logs and metrics uh, much more simple. Next slide. And continue to the, the, the storage parts. We in OpenShift 4.12, we have focused a lot of the feature and uh, version updates of the total of the monitoring stack. So keeping these components and dependencies up to date makes us ensure that the monitoring stack is running optimally and also reducing the risk of encountering errors and such. And for um, for data storage in logging 5.6. 
uh, we are offering stream-based retention for Loki. So rather than having Loki be a, a global retention, you can now um, divide that retention and enable that configuration per tenant and per stream. Next slide. And here we have one of our tech previews, and that is allowed to allow admins to use create the new alerting rules based on the platform metrics. And by providing this capability, you can now set up rules for certain conditions and thresholds and performance related issues. And this will allow the admins to proactively address any issues that may arise within the platform and, and of course, ensure the performance. And for data delivery and logging 5.6, we have a highly requested feature where we have support for forwarding logs to Splunk. Um, it's a huge customer request. Many customers use Splunk. And so we're very excited to offer this feature. Next slide. And here we come in to the visualization parts. And we have now an improved UX experience in the web console. And we're also going to show some, uh, next slide, uh, a demo of that. And we also have support for alert managers, negative matches. Uh, and what that means is that you can silence alerts now directly in the OpenShift web console. And uh, as Roger was saying, we'll have um, a, a visualization in the next slide. But with this uh, logging 5.6 release, you can now explore the logs under the developer console. So we'll have an aggregated logs tab where you'll be able to search, filter, and visualize those logs by severity um, and identify issues for your cluster a lot more quickly. Um, we'll have some predefined filters that'll help a lot for like pods and containers, for example. Um, so that will help um, the searching of the logs um, a lot more quickly. Next slide. And so here on this, you can see a screenshot of what the new um, console will look like for logging. You can see that there is a tab for aggregated logs, and you can see under the filters that there will be options for searching by um, contain, searching by pod and container. Next slide, please. So the last and the fifth pillar that we hope now going forward, we're going to feed a more uh, consistent experience is the data analytics part. And here, from a monitoring perspective, the web console users can now use runbook URLs via the alerting UI. And that means that if an alert includes this URL, you will be able to access the runbook information by clicking on the alert, and then you can address the issue. And uh, also to enhance data analytics and logging, we are including another customer requested feature, which is adding the OpenShift cluster ID to the log records. Uh, that really helps you analyze problems better because you can uniquely identify each of the clusters in your aggregated logs. So you can see uh, at a glance a more clear picture of what's happening. And um, thank you. This is for um, all for observability, and I'll hand off to Tomas. Hi, everybody. Insights continues providing actionable recommendations uh, based on best practice and Red Hat's own experience of managing uh, OpenShift clouds. With the release of OpenShift for the 12, we are expanding this into the workload management with a new capability that will provide you recommendations on things like unset CPU limits or memory configuration for your workloads. Next feature that we're releasing with this OpenShift release is uh, the ability to display uh, most critical recommendations as in cluster alerts so that you would have them handy in the OpenShift web console whenever you utilize the admin. And with that, Pau, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Insights Cost Management? Thank you, Tomas. Yeah, so as customers go to the cloud and decentralize this IT, their problem is now they have a ton of, of cloud accounts, a ton of applications, a ton of Everything running everywhere and promise starts with how much I'm, I'm paying and what I'm paying for, right? And, and Red Hat Cost Management gives you the answer to that. You can add all your cloud accounts to, to cost management and then we will uh, create reports for you. We'll gather all the information and tell you this application is costing you this much for this project or this cluster or this cloud account. You can see consecutive views for all of that 
And the, the use case we're targeting is to give you the fully loaded cost for your application project, whatever, uh, including not, not just the cost of the workload itself, but also the cost of third-party services or the cost of ROSA, the cost of ARO, um, the, the cost of networking storage, all of that. Uh, we are even including now the cost of the unallocated capacity because someone has to pay for that or the cost of the control plane. That's, that's a real cost for you. And, and we are improving also uh, the case of AWS, like sensible, more sensible defaults in case you have savings plans, which is a reality for many of our customers. And I, I think it's, it's very exciting what we have done in the past month. And Dipti, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're constantly trying to evolve to make OpenShift Network better performant and secure. Now, we already heard Mark talk about some of the flagship features uh, for this release in networking area. Along with it, we're very happy to introduce a technical preview of the Ingress Node Firewall Operator. Now, this is basically designed to keep your cluster away from external threats by monitoring and controlling your incoming traffic. The firewall can be configured to allow or block traffic based on a set of rules that is defined by the administrator. And this is very important in terms of a security measure that we can take to prevent unauthorized access to the network and protect your cluster against denial of service attacks. Given that all the deployments are varied with security requirements, we have looked to provide a supported way to deploy firewall rules on OpenShift nodes so that the customer can write their firewall rule set that fits their needs and update them as network configuration evolves through this operator. And this is implemented with an XDP EDPF for high performance. So basically use a custom resource to configure and deploy your rules. We have a web hook that basically validates your configuration. And we have XTP EBPF, uh, you know, which kind of looks into your rules, passes the packets, and you know, takes further actions. In this release, we support configuring stateless policies, and we're looking to evolve this to support of stateful policy in the upcoming release. Next slide, please. So we have undertaken a lot of ingress enhancements in this release based on all customer needs and asks. Now we have the ability to tune your TTL, the time to live duration, for both successful and unsuccessful DNS queries so you can reduce a uh, load on your DNS infrastructure. We've, all, we've also had multiple requests from customers who want to deploy you know, in a DNS zone very different from the cluster DNS zone. And to address this, we've uh, provided the ability to completely disable DNS management on your ingress controller. So now we have two states, managed and unmanaged, and when it is unmanaged, the responsibility falls on the cluster admin. And we also allow seamless transitions between these two management policies. Along with it, um, you know, we have uh, ingress controller autoscaling, which is tech preview for 4.12. Now you can use the custom metrics autoscaler operator to dynamically scale the default ingress controller based on metrics that, that you know, are deployed within your cluster such as number of workloads available, et cetera. Both the cluster metrics autoscaler and the ingress uh, control autoscaling are technical preview. Given with the interest of time, we do not have much to talk about, uh, you know, all of the ingress enhancements that we have undertaken. Uh, I would kindly request you to take a you know, look at the release notes for more details. Next slide, please. And uh, over to Peter for virtualization updates. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. We've got a lot going on when you want to run virtual machines on the OpenShift platform. A lot of them are advanced features that you may be used to on existing platforms, such as uh, a VMware, a VM export, uh, being able to move an actual fully formed VM between different clusters. But we've also paid very close attention to improving the administration experience of virtual machines on a Kubernetes cluster. So we've made great improvements in dashboards with a lot of UX research from our team and feedback from customers. And now we actually have more detailed statistics about what's going on with live migrations, what do the histories look like, and the ability to actually bring in, uh, connect to the cluster via SSH completely through the API. As far as observability goes, again, we wanna focus on not just normal workflow operations, but give you enough detail to actually solve problems on your own without having to be a Kubernetes expert. So how many migrations are actually in progress right now? How many are scheduled? Are VMs migrating too frequently? A lot of that information should be exposed to the administrator in a very easy way. Also, we wanted to make the experience of just a normal OpenShift upgrade much more, uh, much less noisy. 
And so there were a couple of false alerts that we've actually toned that down. And the issues that actually do come up will be uh, things that you probably do need to pay attention to. As you know, virtual machines on, a Kuber on OpenShift are good citizens of the Kubernetes platform. So as new features like Metal LB show up, we want to ensure that mo virtual machines can actually take advantage of these as well. Since we're running KVM VMs, we want to make sure that both for RHEL, uh, RHEL, I think 9.1 is the fully supported guest, and Windows support for things that we can do today, UEIF, uh, UEFI boot, uh, uh, secure boot, and the virtual TPM is tech preview at the moment. Um, we're working to get that completed and making sure that you can actually upgrade your guests in a very seamless way. You heard earlier about great capabilities coming with the Tecton pipelines, uh, OpenShift developer pipelines. We want to make sure that virtual machines can participate in that, and we'll be shipping examples that you can actually use within your own environment. One last thing I want to talk about is sandbox containers. Right now, uh, run on bare metal, that level of isolation is available for on-premise. We want to make sure that that's available on any footprint. So we're going to start with a developer preview on AWS. We'd be very interested if, you're in, if you want to try that out and give us feedback, and that will actually help drive our future product direction. Now let's turn it over to Duncan Hardy to talk about Windows Worker. Excellent, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, so Windows, it's the only reason you've come on this session today, I admit it. Um, so um, what's happening? Well, we've got a, a Windows machine configura configuration operator 7.0.0 release due. So as always, we try to align that with the OpenShift releases. And what we're doing here is adding in support for Google GCP. So all that wonderful goodness that you've experienced on the other platforms you can now have on Google as well. Um, just do you know on this thing that um, we're only supporting the Windows Server 2022 with the appropriate patch that I'm not going to bore you by reading out. So there's no support for earlier versions there, but we're excited to let you try it. But even more exciting, I think it's now to, time for Erwin to tell us all about KMM. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, we are announcing the general availability of uh, the kernel module management operator, also called uh, KMM. So KMM is a day to operator uh, helping partners to enable hardware. So it could be AI uh, hardware accelerator for training or telco layer one accelerators. So KMM is upstream in Kubernetes Signode, so it's an enabler for new stack, new hardware that partners want to, to enable quickly. It can be used permanently or for a transition period, uh, waiting for the driver to get uh, upstream entry on downstream uh, inbox. So KMM can build, sign, and load uh, kernel drivers. Uh, it could be used, uh, for example, uh, to, for UEFI secure boot uh, with uh, signatures, and it can also enable uh, device plugins. So KMM supports uh, loading device firmware, so that can be specific to kernel modules based on uh, uh, regular expressions. So KMM can manage all the life cycle of these kernel modules, and it's replacing the, the component S0. So KMM and driver toolkit are going GA, and the feature, a sub-feature of KMM for Hub and Spock is tech preview on, uh, and will be soon uh, here. So you have here an example of uh, using a KMM operator, and this example is loading, uh, building first some drivers and, and also loading uh, additional drivers. So it's really a simple enablement uh, for, for partner to, to enable their accelerated stack. So KMM um, is falling under the third party support policy. So it means that uh, uh, these kernel modules uh, have to be certified, but the support of third party kernel modules are not supported by Red Hat. They will have to be supported by uh, the partner who are building this drive. So I'm handing over to Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Operator Framework introduced a simplified process to generate operator catalogs. So whether you are a OpenShift user or certified partners, releasing your operator to OpenShift with semantic versioning becomes a lot easier. As you can see in this example, a new catalog template is introduced where you can easily see and add your release versions. OPM will process this template 
and generates the lower level replace and skip attributes behind the scene for you. Channel names are auto-generated, so you can easily deliver releases into stable, fast, or candidate channels, just like OpenShift. You are not required to maintain the update graph manually. Release with higher version numbers will, re will replace the older ones. Cross-channel update edge are also auto-generated according to the best practices. You can store this template in the Git repositories. What it means is publish a net new release or releasing a patch for an older version becomes an easy one-liner change in this YAML file. This is developer preview in 4.12, so we would love your feedback. Next, I'll hand it over to Gregory to talk about storage. Thanks, Tony, and hello, everyone. Full uh, 12 brings a couple of interesting updates on the storage side. Let's have a look at them. So starting with cloud provider CSR drivers, we are adding tech produce support for Google Cloud File Store, allowing OpenShift cluster running on top of GCP to consume file back storage with RWX access mode. Um, file Store use NFS protocol underneath for your information. And next update uh, is around CSI migration. In 4.11, we announced a GA for Azure Disk and OpenStack Cinder. In 4.12, we are adding uh, AWS EBS and GC Disk, the list of fully supported CSI migrations. As a reminder, uh, CSI migration works as on, on the fly in memory translation layer. It doesn't involve any data migration nor any manual intervention from admins or user. It is transparent and enabled by default to NGA. Next slide, please. Um, so we would like to take the opportunity to give an important heads up on cluster that are running on top of vSphere. Uh, CSI migration for vSphere will be supported in OCP 413. Uh, VMware recommends to run vSphere 702 before enabling migration. For this reason, upgrades to 413 will be blocked until the vSphere environment is running version 702 or newer. Uh, in the same vein, clusters that are currently using a third-party vSphere CSI driver, uh, because two drivers um, cannot run at the same time, uh, and for Red Hat to properly support CSI migration, um, we are asking customers to replace the third-party CSI driver by the one shipped with OpenShift. Uh, switching drivers does not involve any downtime, uh, data loss, or performance issues. Next slide, please. Another update on the VMware side, uh, we are introducing support for vSphere CSI uh, topology awareness. Uh, this allows operators to create zones across multiple vSphere cluster and ensure that the PVs are stored into the same data store zone as the worker running on the pod. Uh, it's quite useful for defining failure domains and making sure that storage remains local to that zone. Um, this is currently implemented as a day two manual operation. In 4.13, we are planning to improve the operator experience with IPI integration to automate the configuration through the installer. Uh, next slide, please. Now into what's new in, uh, oh, should be ODF. Oh. All right. Anyway, um, so LVM. Um, we are happy to announce the uh, general availability of LVM storage, previously known as uh, ODF LVM operator. Uh, this solution, available for single node OpenShift, is based on the Topo LVM CSI upstream project. Uh, it enables feature rich block and file local storage management, management with features such as thin polygoning, snapshots, and clones, all backed with, uh, by the well known logical volume manager shipped with RHEL. Uh, it was, it's worth noting that this um, technology was previously included in OpenShift Data Foundation as technology preview. Starting for 12, it's now uh, generally available to every SNO OpenShift customer, ODF or not. Uh, however, uh, reinstall from a previous tech preview version is necessary. There is no upgrade path from pre-GA version. And um, that is it for storage, uh, ending over to Frank. Oh, now we have ODF, okay, which, all right. Uh, 
the what's new in ODF? Uh, so in this release, we are promoting the Metro DR as TA. Um, this solution uses synchronous data replication. Uh, the regional uh, DR solution, which uses asynchronous data replication, has been improved with support for um, AWX file volumes, in addition to block, both as tech preview. Uh, we expanded our KMS support to additional vendors that use KM IP, like Teles and other. Um, we also have uh, IPv6 single stack support. Um, IPv6 dual stack is still in dev preview and planned for GA in ODF 413. Finally, uh, we are adding dev preview support for FML inline volumes as well as non regional. Uh, storage class that relies on a single replica storage pool. And now that is it for storage. Uh, handing over to Frank for Telco 5G. Thanks, Greg. So, Telco Data Plane applications are built on top of DPDK around an active loop in order to achieve a maximum of performance. If the CPU holds, even for a couple of microseconds, packets will be dropped and the application SLA won't be met. So to avoid any CPU halt before OpenG 4.12, worker node hosting even a single DPDK pod had to have all CPU power management features globally disabled. As a consequence, the regular pods that do not run DPDK cannot benefit from the CPU power management, leading to power overconsumption. End users usually mitigate this by, by, by having two sets of worker nodes, one set for DPDK workload, one set for non-DPDK workload. This increases OPEX and only partially resolves the issue as we need to run regular pods on every worker node anyway. This is particularly obvious for single node OpenShift use case where with 5G RAM, where all OpenShift regular pods are running beside the DPDK pods. Thanks to this feature, we can now configure CPU power state per pod. This allows to enable CPU power saving on all CPU by default, and CPU power saving feature are then disabled for isolated pods that require it via the two annotation that you can see on the slide. This means also that we can now have a single CPU power efficient configuration for a whole cluster as high power demanding pods and regular pods can now run on the same node. Next slide, please. So, when deploying a 5G RAN network with tens of thousands of sites, every installation needs to be as fast as possible. And at the edge location, downloading OpenShift installation artifacts can be pretty long. This new feature drastically reduces the installation time by pre-downloading the installation artifact at the factory, so the technician at the far edge side can rack, cable, and power the server. Then, ACM hub cluster running on his, in a central data center connect to the single node OpenShift and trigger the installation that use pre-stage artifact instead of downloading them, making the whole procedure very fast. Thanks. Back to you, Tushar. Uh, thank you, uh, Frank. Thank you, uh, my uh, OpenShift PM team. Um, you know, and thank you all for listening. Uh, you know, um, uh, thanks for all your questions and any you know, answered questions, we'll answer them offline. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the year, rest of the quarter, and we'll see you again soon.